Uh, now I'd like to call up the uh, participants for the second panel. Uh, so if I can have Jacques Arnoul, uh, who is um, ethics advisor to the Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales. Um, Reinhold Ewald, unfortunately, is not with us. Uh, Alice Gorman, who is a uh, senior lecturer in archaeology at Flinders University. Um, Pam Melroy, who is also based in Australia, but obviously a uh, former uh, NASA astronaut and, um, and uh, uh, with Nova Systems as well in Australia. And then we also have, participating via recording, we have um, Scott Kelly, and that's actually going to kind of structure how we proceed. So um, we have given Scott three questions, which I will read, and then you will hear him if the technology works, of course, you will hear him respond. And then what I will do is I'll ask um, our panelists if they have some responses. Maybe we can start with Pam each time just because you might have particular insights about being present in the same space and, and that, that sort of thing. Um, but let's begin. Uh, so the first question that we posed was, we often talk about ISS not only as a scientific experimental platform, but also as a laboratory for international relations. Doing so, we set science and politics in opposition. How did you experience this personally in daily activities aboard ISS? How much did international companionship seem, quote unquote, experimental to you, either on board or during training? Well, I do believe the space station is a uh, example of how we can work cooperatively in space in an international environment with uh, with our international partners. I do think it's one of the great things about, if not the greatest thing about the International Space Station is we did something that is incredibly challenging and difficult, quite possibly the most uh, challenging thing we've ever done, building this million pound space station. And we did it um, as an international partnership. Um, you know, I loved uh, spending time in space with all my crew members, but when you spend uh, time in space with people from other cultures, um, people that came from different places with different, um, you know, different habits, different beliefs, it makes the experience much more enriching and uh, much more rewarding. So, um, you know, just to summarize, I think uh, the greatest thing about the space station is that it's an international space station. He and I flew uh, together on my first flight, and um, that was fantastic. We have so many stories. It's just, just running through my head all the all the great times that we had together. And um, uh, I flew with a Russian crew member on my second flight, and flew with um, an Italian uh, ESA astronaut, Paolo Nespoli, on my third flight. And I, I think. Um, you know what's kind of interesting about it, I think especially for shuttle crew members, is the important time is actually the time on the ground. And the time that we spent with each other's families and in each other's homes. Um, I still have a recollection. Um, the Russian crew member that I flew with was uh, Fyodor Yurchikin, and he's an outstanding cook. And so he prepared some amazing meals for us from some uh, food from the region that he's originally from that um, we still, our crew still talks about because uh, the food was so amazing. And I think that was really, really important. Um, I think even more so maybe on the space station because you're away from your family for a long time. Kind of actually, um, things happen. You get off the telecon, you know, with a video uh, with your child, um, and maybe it's a good conversation and maybe it's not so good. And um, as, as always happens in families, right? You know, <laughs> you, you help them with their homework, it's all good. Uh, when they're in trouble, it's not so good. Um, but to know each other's families and have that, um, that relationship, I think was incredibly important. And, uh, you know, I think the overarching thing that I took away as well is that although we did have different expectations and sometimes, um, uh, thoughts that were different about how things, some, something should go or unfold, the fact that we all believed in human spaceflight together made the path forward very easy because we had to get to yes, we had to solve the problem, and we had to get there. I think it's much harder for international efforts where there isn't 
that level of passion for the thing that you're doing together. And uh, so between the personal passion and for, for um, each other and our families and what we were, and what we were doing, that's what uh, made it so special. That's great. And actually, before Alice responds, I just wanted to point out that this is probably the first panel of any kind uh, about the International Space Station, or possibly even <clears throat> about uh, space at all, where we have space agency administrators, we have crew members, we have physical scientists, and we have social scientists as well, all present. In so this is an exciting uh, pa a session for that reason. So Alice, if you would like to uh, respond. Oh, well, well, listening to what Pam was talking about and people from the previous panel, something I think is really striking about the ISS is its engagement with different kinds of communities. And there's those communities of agencies and national technological um, assets and people who have lived on it and worked on it. But there's another really significant community for whom the ISS is, is, is incredibly important. And this is something that I've seen emerge over the last few years, which is the equation of the ISS with the, the sleigh of Santa Claus or Father Christmas where little kids are now being taken out by their parents to watch the ISS and say, you know, there goes Santa Claus. And I think, and that's the whole thing. So jean Jacques has said it's too big, but it's big enough to be seen by little kids on the surface of the earth on Christmas Eve. So that's a whole community. They might not care about the science. They may not have engaged at all with what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis inside the station or all of those big level political things. But here are these little kids and their parents for whom this is a really special event that marks a very special calendrical event in their lives as well. And I think that's um, amazing stuff. It creates a memory, right? Yes, yes. It, it creates a culture on the ground around the ISS for regular, everyday people. Excellent. Jacques? Uh, may I introduce something coming from, not from archaeology, but from history? Um, Please. <laughs> if you remember, uh, in the, especially in the uh, Occidental story, during a very long time, uh, we think that we are living in a sphere, it's a terrestrial sphere, and it's our home for the eternity. It was impossible to imagine that someday we are, or some of you, and, and we by this way, uh, have the possibility to go in space. And so it's during century and century, this terrestrial sphere. And now we have another sphere, and in the ISS is a cupola. It's a space sphere. And now we are inhabiting, living in this sphere in space, and have a look on Earth, on space. And this is a totally new perspective. And for me, it's one of the most uh, extraordinary experience for you, but for us by this way, uh, this totally opposite. What is the lesson? We have always to reshape our way of thinking to prepare the future. During century, the fact is we, we are living on Earth for the eternity. And step by step, due to uh, Sputnik, uh, it's the anniversary, uh, and Gagari is the anniversary day today, and now by the ASS, we can prepare the future. But preparing the future again, we, we are thinking today, what, what is, ne where is the necessity to, to, to have a new view, uh, to reshaping our way of thinking? For me, it's a challenge for the future. And ISS is, is only one step, and we can go today in this uh, Cooper as fair and thinking, what is the next step? Excellent, thank you. Okay, so the second question, <clears throat> the second question as we posed it to Scott was, more than any other ISS visitors, you and Mikhail Kornienko experienced during one year all the joys, frustrations, decreasing mood, nostalgia, excitement, or endurance that future crews will experience. What terrestrial habits did you keep and how did you adapt them to your orbital life? Most of the terrestrial habits I kept uh, while I was in space really had, uh, was mostly had to do with keeping in touch with people on Earth. You know, the, the environment of the ISS is so different that, you know, a lot of the things you do at home, you know, it's not really practical to do it there. Um, but, you know, I think the human connection 
was the most important uh, thing for me to help me get through uh, a year in space with enough uh, energy and enthusiasm at the end that I had in the beginning. Uh, I think it was critical that I was able to uh, work on a project with um, Amico, who, my wife Amico, um, which was the social media aspect of that flight. And that, you know, allowed us to stay connected and talk about uh, things that were related to the mission and not, uh, you know, just every day kind of having a similar conversation of what's uh, going on on Earth. So I think, you know, having the ability to connect with uh, people, whether it's with email, uh, the uh, IP phone, uh, video conferences is, is incredibly important. But also, you know, having things that you can work on uh, with people that are important in your life, uh, but those people are on Earth. Um, you know, besides that, I can think of, you know, a few things I would, you know, I had similar like TV or movie watching habits. I, you know, watch a lot of CNN at home and, you know, I uh, did that in space. We had it on every day. So that kind of made me feel connected to the earth, you know, listening to, um, you know, television during the workday and the news of what was going on on the planet. Uh, I think that really helped my state of mind and helped me uh, feel feel connected. Um, uh, it was also a good way to tell if we had a KU band uh, connection on the space station. So it was like a uh, audio cue of whether uh, we had KU, which was um, a nice uh, bonus for for that. So. You know, I, th I think, to, again, to summarize, you know, I think the human connection is uh, is very important uh, with people on the earth. And like I said, you know, the news and uh, TV ha TV habits for me felt me made me uh, feel more connected to life on earth and allowed me to, uh, you know, experience a space station with less uh, frustration effects on my mood and uh uh, help me get through the mission and finish with uh, a lot of energy and, th and enthusiasm. Okay, so Pam, do you want to follow up on that maybe? Yeah, I, I um, flew with uh, international crew members. Can we I personally might say that going to space seems like a good way to escape email. But uh, I don't know about anybody else. Uh, Pam, do you have... Trust me, it's not a good way to escape email. <laughs> it doesn't work that way at all. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> my perspective is going to be different than Scott's because I was a shuttle crew member. So from my perspective, um, uh, I didn't quite know what to expect on my first flight. And in terms of how easy it would be to do certain things. And so I just um, had a very open mind about it. But one thing that I have done every single night for my entire life is read for a few minutes before I go to bed. I'm a very avid reader, and I find it's a way for me to disconnect from the day and get into a different place and prepare myself to go to sleep because I'm not constantly revisiting either the problems of today or what I'm anticipating tomorrow. So I did take a book with me in space on my first flight, and I was very happy that I did. And even though I was mostly exhausted, and it was actually a little complicated to, to wrestle this book with a piece of Velcro on it near where, you know, um, I did read every night before I went to sleep. And, um, and, and I found that was incredibly helpful. It's hard to sleep, especially on the shuttle. I think, um, you know, it, it is the entire experience of being on a shuttle mission is so intense, so booked, and, you know, tomorrow is, you know, something huge again, and then the day after that is another huge thing, you know, something you've been rehearsing for for months, and so the ability to kind of um, be calm and have this habit that I had on, on the earth to help me feel grounded, and so I thought a lot of, more about it on my uh, subsequent flights, and I took a book each time, but I picked... Um, uh, I also tried to pay attention to my crew members. And for example, um, on my second flight, uh, I brought up the um, NBL, the pool briefing, on a recorded message. So uh, when the two spacewalkers were in the airlock waiting for the depress, 
I played the recording for them. So they practiced multiple times in the pool and they were used to this little song that plays and there's a little safety briefing. It says the divers are gonna do this and this kind of thing. And you know, it was really, really interesting talking to um, Dave and Piers afterwards. They were like, yeah, you know, cause then we got into the mode, we, we know how to do this. We've done this before. We're just gonna go do EVA two again. And, and, um, and on my third flight, um, one of my crew members showed up every single morning with coffee from the same coffee shop in, um, in Houston. So I went to the coffee shop and I cut out uh, the logo and I, would, I, I had it on a piece of Velcro and I would stick it on his coffee in the morning and give it to him. And you know, it was just little things like that that I think, you know, they make people laugh, but they also, they kind of reset you from a very high stress level into uh, you know normal somehow you just calm down right because it, it's all feels comfortable and like you're you're at home terrific thank you alice well i think about these things obviously from an archaeological perspective and something i find really intriguing is that there are things like velcro um ziploc or snaplock bags that i'm quite obsessed with and cable ties that are just they're things that probably everybody here has one or more of them in their house or in their workshop or whatever they use them you use them for all kinds of things and then they migrate into space they're they're um some of them are on space satellites and other spacecrafts snaplock bags are inside the iss uh and velcro and uh ziplock bags are both used here we just on earth we just put things in them and that's great but up there they're actually a a technology you use to replicate the effects of earth gravity so you can read your book or also you can make sure things stay where they are so they're habit forming as well but the habits are kind of the they're not the opposite i suppose they're they're an adaptation and this is the kind of thing that um uh, justin and i are extremely interested in obviously in our archaeological project but just the the everydayness of some of these objects is something I think is really significant and, and really interesting and how they migrate between these different spheres and end up performing different roles. Great. And Jacques? Uh, for me, behind this uh, question of the relation with Earth is the question of uh, exploration and what means today, especially and for tomorrow, uh, exploration. and. Because we are so connected, uh, even between ISS and Earth, uh, and probably a little beyond, that uh, it's not the same condition and situation as before. I don't know what was the equivalent of the coffee shop for Christopher Columbus. Um, something another, but uh, how to prepare the future with uh, uh, other condition of exploration, especially in space? And um, it's probably very, something very specific, but uh, um, I remember a few months ago with this uh, very nice mission of uh, Thomas Pesquet, Proxima. It was a, na a very interesting <coughs> name. Proxima was, is not only a name of a star, but also, also it was a connection between Thomas and, and the French people. And how to manage the relation in the future between space explorer on the moon and beyond, with, with their own family, with Earth, is not so proximity. Or, and for me, it's a challenge for the, again, for the future, because I know that Jean-Jacques is preferring to speak about the future. But for me, it's a real, uh, very interesting topic, and challenging topic, in fact, for the explorer and for us uh, remaining on Earth. Excellent. OK, our third question. Based on your in-flight psychological, physiological, and intellectual experience, including on various space vehicles, how would you see the continuing role of ISS in the near future of human space exploration? In the uh, remaining years that the space station has, I think uh, you know we need to focus on finishing up the science uh, you know that we've started and uh, hopefully get some good results. Um, you know, especially about the uh, you know the human physiology part of that and uh, you know zeroing in, zeroing in on the things that will help us uh, go to Mars and have people to show up there with uh, you know in good physical condition 
I, th- I think, though, the greatest success of the uh, space station program, the, the biggest experiment is just the whole thing. You know, having people live and work in space and supporting them and having the systems that keep them alive, the in- infrastructure. You know, we've learned such a great deal about that with the space station. And I think that is the most important experiment of the uh, the whole program. And then also the fact that we did this as, as an international partnership. You know, 15 different countries, different languages, different cultures, sometimes, you know, different technical ways of doing things. This is the hardest thing we've ever done. And I think that is the most significant role in it is that it is just incredibly challenging and hard. And we've been able to do it successfully uh, for 20 years now. And we haven't, uh, you know, so far so good. Uh, you know, no one's been, uh, you know, hurt or injured and we've avoided any serious problems. To me, that is the most significant thing. Okay. Uh, for reasons of time, if I could just ask for brief answers from Pam, Alice, and Jacques. Um, so I think um, that we're going to see continued science, like Scott said. I think that's actually really important. Um, low Earth orbit is actually the right place to do microgravity experiments. I mean, I think there's going to be things that, uh, different experiments we're going to want to do on the moon and in lunar orbit. But if it's, a, if it's a microgravity experiment, being close to the Earth and going to and fro is really important. I think we'll also see it as a training ground for the future. Um, we have a whole new set of challenges to experience going to the moon and onto Mars. And I think we'll need to uh, continue to have a place uh, to explore technologies, but also to train future astronauts. When I think about the possible end of the ISS, I think what it would feel like for us to stand on the surface of the Earth and know that there's maybe nobody in orbit above us, or nobody permanently living in orbit above us. And I think we've become so used to it in 20 years, I think that would feel really weird and strange now. So I think this is something that has to be maintained because it seems unthinkable that we could become confined back to the surface of the Earth. So I want to see this stuff continue into the future. I, I totally agree with Alison. This experiment of uh, uh, in the future, nobody above us, uh, very strange experience. You can do that uh, even in your own imagination. And, uh, it's a combination between what you say and this, what you said before, the fact that we can see this uh, ISS in the sky. And uh, Jean-François and me, we have the, the experience one, one year ago. It was very strange. And, and we have to share that with uh, everybody around us because we know that uh, on the Earth, a lot of people have no idea of that. And now we have to use this time of ISS remaining in, in space and trying to share that uh, outside the space community and using uh, arts and culture and, and uh, uh, you are doing that uh, and uh, it's very very necessary to, to invest in this uh, open field of culture. That's actually a great segue into our third panel because we'll be talking a little bit about outreach uh, with science in that, in that uh, panel but before we move on to that I just want to give the opportunity to the audience to pose one question so if there's somebody who has a question for this panel or maybe not. I don't see any hands. Are you sure? Oh, we've got one over here. Hi, my name is Katarina Kassen from DLR Space Agency, Germany. Um, we're in a time where internationally we're having a lot of conflicts and maybe a little bit of a drawback to nationalism. Do you think this might at all interfere or uh, influence the future, the corporate, uh, cooperative nature of human space flight? So it's sort of going back to nation-specific projects, race to the Mars, or something like that. Thank you. Panelists. Uh, I, actually, I think uh, Jean-Jacques was talking about Apollo Soyuz. Uh, trust me, that was a way harder time than what we're going through right now. And I think um, we're in a very good place because we have built these strong relationships. Um, it, it is, uh, there's no question that it's a challenge, but it's also widely acknowledged that it's also a relief that we have a way to communicate with each other where we're talking about things that are shared values. And uh, so I think I would, I would put the question the other way is, 
the more projects like ISS, um, the better our international cooperation in other areas it will be. Great, okay, well thank you panelists.